Hello, listeners. It's Adrian here from Market Attack, and we're back with another super guest. We've got Konstantinos Dimopoulos on the show. Um, a real, a real interesting guy, and, and very kindly sent me your recent book, Virtual Cities. And we're going to talk about the book a lot. But firstly, thank you for your time today, Konstantinos. Oh, seriously, thank you for for having me. I think you know it's a pleasure to to chat it's with a real you. One. And actually. We've, 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 I've, I do look at your Twitter account quite often. I like to share a lot of stuff. And I actually find um, we actually got in contact a, a few months ago when uh, I think mm-hmm. I shared uh, my Steve Purcell interview mm. on Sam and Max. And obviously yeah. you, you, you're clearly a fan and you, you shared it and you, I think you commented. And I was like, wow, this is, this is lovely. And we, we kind of got in contact then. And uh, we'll talk a bit more about that later. But it's been a real, real honour actually get, getting you on the site before for the text interview. But getting you actually speaking now, I can't wait. No, oh, thanks so much. Seriously, that's and that's. Uh, I think one of the fine things that social media has achieved is actually getting to know people you'd like to eventually get to know. So that's that's nice. That's you know this semi-random encounter, which is quite lovely to be honest. I completely agree because I've never been to Athens. That's where you're speaking from, and uh, yes. I, you know we probably wouldn't without social media. We wouldn't really interact. We True. wouldn't know each other, and it's been really interesting. And actually. I have to say, well, <laughs> you've got a PhD in urban planning geography. Is that right? Yes, yes. Which, which is an amazing PhD. But I don't want to sound rude, and I don't we get offended. But I still, when 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 I've done a bit of research, we you answer the original questions. I still couldn't quite understand how that links into the video game industry. So I have to ask you. I mean, you've got a great a great PhD, but did you ever think? you'd get into the gaming industry with that particular uh, qualification? No, I admittedly no. I mean, it definitely wasn't a plan. And I mean, mo- most of the stuff I was doing professionally up to 2010 was completely unrelated to, to games. I mean, besides besides game being, games being something, you know, I was interested in as, as a hobby, as a pastime, as something to, you know, maybe write about in a, you know, very amateurish hobbyist way. So it, it, it's just a completely unexpected route, if you want. I mean, the, how, the, the way things evolved was completely unexpected, but quite, quite, um, you know, nice. The things ended up nice. I mean, I, I like doing stuff for games and, and, and combining, you know, this, this interest for citizens, urbanism and geography with uh, the, the old hobby, if you want, which is... Yeah, yeah. Quite unexpected, to be honest. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk actually before we get really in the nuts and bolts of it. What what sort of video games did you like playing when you were growing up? What were your favourite consoles or computers? Well, uh, mainly we... mainly computers, to be honest. Yeah, almost exclusively, with, with the exception of handhelds, perhaps. Yeah, like, like the Game Boy and the Lynx and this sort of thing. Other than that, I think most of the people I knew, and uh, you know, the kids and everything, we, we, we tended to play on, you know, PCs and Amigas and everything uh, of the of sort. Yes. So that would have to mostly be, you know, adventure games and RPGs and, you know, the, the genres that are more narrative heavy, I would say. Yes. Yeah, pro- probably, probably that. Like heavier on the world, bu- the world yeah. building and narrative. Well, I know you're a, uh, a fan of Lucas Arts, and oh, we yeah. can. I know you've got one one of the great towns in your book. We talk about <laughs> things. I was really interested in that, especially. Um, but I, you know, I, I was growing up on the Amiga. I grew up on the Monkey Island games, and, and so mm. absolutely incredible, aren't they? Yes, they are. And admittedly, the you know the the Amiga and, and some of the older micros just they, they sort of had a personality to them. The, you knew that there was a particular type of game that you would expect to find on the Amiga, like, or an aesthetic, for example, you know, this this chrome palette and everything. Whereas this is sort of getting lost. I mean, obviously on a PC, you wouldn't expect something like that. You have like this huge ecosystem. But but even when it comes to consoles, I mean, in my eyes, the Xbox One and the PlayStation 5, 4, whatever, they, they, they sort of merge. I mean, they do have their standout exclusives, but they're not like, I mean, Bloodborne could easily have appeared on an Xbox console, and I don't know, Halo could have easily made a career on PlayStation. It's essentially interchangeable. Not necessarily yeah. a bad thing, just different, I suppose. Yeah, I suppose the Switch maybe stands out yes. a little bit yeah. from the it, other two. Have, I, yeah. 
yeah, you have Nintendo with a, with a very specific specific philosophies, which is which is yeah, quite refreshing, really. In, yeah, in I agree actually. Um, I'd love to I'd love to ask you actually, Constantine. Was there a sure. moment when you thought you've got a PhD in urban planning geography, and you're obviously into games? But when was there like a a light bulb moment you thought? <laughs> I can combine my two, my my love of games, my skills in that particular area, and I can actually, you know, help develop maps and develop the, the sort of atmosphere and the environment. Was there, a, or is it a very organic thing? I'd love to understand how it actually sort of fell in your lap, kind well, of thing. Well, it's a combination of both. I mean, I had started actually working on games a bit earlier with a few friends in a small, we formed a small indie studio and we we did a couple IO stuff, iOS stuff, and and everything. And then when this sort of failed. Um, I started working with with another team of um, you know aspiring writers and designers and programmers and, and we created this we were building this uh, text heavy RPG that would take place in a city and I was actually designing the city you know just wow. making up the districts and, and the overall layout and at some point I just realized that oh look this this is something that probably other people can't quite do and this is something that's seems unique to me and might be of interest to you know larger teams and groups and stuff and this is something that i can do probably pretty well and this was like the the moment that helped me decide to actually give it a go i mean it was you weren't certain that things would work out i mean that you, that you would be able to earn a living out of making you know virtual cities but eventually you can do I mean, combine it with other game stuff, and you can do probably. Did your Did you manage to finish that game in the end with your friends? No, or was that, was no, that... no. Sadly, we, I mean, we had like seven or eight writers, two concept artists. We had everything, but not a programmer. And we found uh. one, and then he bailed out. And then we found a small team, and they eventually didn't could make it either. So, so we didn't manage to get the the prototype. Out, so yeah, I mean, we had this small sad. prototype, yeah, but it, I think it, it can be done, it can be resurrected at some point, yeah, yeah. probably will. Well, ho hopefully, it will do then. Um, yeah, <laughs> would you be able to explain to our listeners a bit more about your actual job? Uh, not, not about the, the author side of things, but actually helping out uh, some of the games you've helped out and what, what how, how you go about designing maps and so forth. What, what exactly is your role, if you don't mind? So it it varies wildly depending on on project. Mm. So I mean, I have, uh, for example, in the Sinking City by Frogwares, which was one of the first like bigger games I worked on. I mean, the the idea was to come up with to to help with the pre production phase, like make a list of what we want to achieve and what to look out for and how we can support the specific atmosphere we're looking you know via the urban environment like we won't make it an upset and up, upsetting and you know disorienting space and this space can have those values i mean by itself and then you know in other games like uh, i'm trying to think i'm trying to think of no non nda stuff like i mean i i've worked with with for example bohemia and i know exactly what i did but i'm not exactly certain whether i can right i'm allowed to, to yeah. describe it yeah but i mean for example in in uh, lake a forthcoming uh, indie game by game use um what i did was essentially you know consult on the wider environment of the game the whole open world and and design the city and then make certain it was um you know abstracted uh, in a proper way, because admittedly, yeah. I mean, you always have to take the um, the manpower available into consideration. You cannot have you know limitless assets and um, all sorts of details. So you always start with something you would like to see and then try to to trim it down. I suppose even even CD Project Red had to do something like that up to a point with Night City, for example. I mean, you never you can never have the fidelity and and granularity you want. But I mean, this was this was like a more traditional. Let's create the proper city map and let's see what has to be placed inside the city, from from characters to you know decorations to the overall road plan. Yeah. And then sometimes you get to work on systems, like in a, in a city building game for 
there was a game that had to do with was a cyberpunk city building game it's still under development so you sort of had to do that in in other games you create city concepts and flesh them out depending on on what is needed so generally speaking you have like those two disciplines which is which are urbanism and game design they're both incredibly wide yeah, yeah, yeah. And when you combine them, you have something that's, you know, stupidly wide. So you can get to do all sorts of wildly, wildly different stuff, which is nice. And also, you know, it's interesting, quite tiresome. I mean, every project sort of involves a new round of research almost yeah. by default. But it's, it's yeah. I, I enjoy that a lot. Do you, do you draw the maps out as well? Do you kind of lay out where you think yeah. the shots will be next? I mean, yes. is it like a bird's eye view? I mean, I, I'm quite, is it on paper well, or is it computer? It's usually on paper, though, some stuff. I mean, the stuff where, where scale really matters and you don't want to, you know, spend hours like doing technical drawings. That they, I mean, you can use just a CAD program to, to do what you need, but it's usually sketches and um, a few details. So you always have a top down view. You, ne you absolutely yeah. need that. You usually need at least a few side views if you want to emphasize, say, the skyline or the, um, the importance of topography. So if you're going to do like this monumental Baroque-like city, you will have to have, for example, your cathedral on top, a hill or, or, or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you it, it depends again on the type of uh, city you want to do. But usually you need a few sketches. I never do, you know, the production quality artwork. It's just, you know, something for the writer to take a, and turn into something beautiful. It's just functional stuff. I have to ask, actually, because uh, kind of leading your book a little bit here. For example, when I, when I was a kid playing these games in the Amiga, like, like uh, it came from the desert, for example, mm. I, I almost took the map, the locations for granted. And when I play video games, it, I never really clocked um, how important that environment was. I just always kind of looked at the characters or the story. Was was that the same for you? Or did you always have an appreciation for the kind of background, the, the maps, the settings? Because that's maybe where we might differ a little bit, maybe. I think, I mean, I've never, I've never actually thought about it, but I think you might have a point there. I mean, I do remember actually being very intrigued by the worlds themselves. For example, in, in Monkey Island or in Moonstone. Do you remember Moonstone? Oh, I love that game. Yeah. I, love I mean, that game. obviously you love the, the animations and the combat and everything, but you, I always keep you know, trying to, to sort of imagine this, this place in, in reality. Yeah. So, yeah, but it's, I mean, still always cared about the characters and stuff, but it's, I think, yeah, I might have had an eye out or details of the environmental sort, probably. Yeah, yeah, most of them amazing. Yeah, it, mm. it, can, it can make a huge difference to how good a game is, can't it? The, the map, the setting, the way True. it's laid out. I, 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 I'm giving it more thought. When I've got your book, I'm not just saying this, but when I've got your book recently and just thinking about your, your job role, it just makes me appreciate <laughs> the maps and the settings even more. Um, I mean, can you ask, when you do start a new game, have you got any criteria or, or like a checklist of what you think makes a perfect map? Uh, what you think needs to be in there? Is there anything that has to happen or is it, does it change by title I mean, by title? Obviously, things do change title by title, but I mean, the, there are always certain, let's say, uh, approaches that are applicable in most cases. For example, you, you want to create places or help create places that will feel real i mean illusions that are convincing so they are coherent and they sort of feel sensible even if they are you know this weird take on an 80s crime city what that doesn't matter what as long as it feels coherent it, it's good and i always try to to push people to take the way people live into consideration i mean you have the, the cities are are more than their you know actual physical um environment they're not just you know the buildings and the roads they're actually the people in the society is living there and they can be very distinct yeah and you know all, always i'm very very irritating when it comes to scale i mean you have to feel the scale of things even in the in the small things i mean it's different being at a pub say in london than being at a pub in brighton it's a completely yes. different feel 
So this thing is something, I mean, you can convey the metropolitan scale even from a small thing, even from a very specific place. And, you know, the, the thing that people love to do in games, I mean, you're in this huge RPG, you're in this supposedly huge town, and they tell you, you go, I don't know, to Adrian, he's the butcher. And so, I mean, come on, you have like <laughs> one butcher in this two million people town. There's like one. It's, it's such a silly mistake, and people constantly do that. Mm. And it's, it's just, you know, getting scale wrong. Right, and yeah, then, yeah. And, you know, I, I always think that sometimes we, we have to try and make you know, our, our creations memorable in, in ways that are not, you know, like cheap or kitsch or, or, or blatantly there just to make things memorable, but they have to be memorable. They have to, to offer a combination of, um, say, elements and, and, and styles and yeah. lifestyles that make people remember that, I don't know, Anor Londo is a unique place because it's, it's an illusion and it's scary and it's whatever, but it's also beautiful. I mean, you have to somehow try and think that how can I distill my set in like two or three sentences? This is what I want people to remember after a couple of years since they play the game. And actually, yeah, I there is some games where I think they've got it spot on and I'm, I, I, you don't have to agree with me, but I'm thinking of the Zelda games. Mm. They all seem to tick those boxes. Obviously, the LucasArts games like the Fate of Atlantis. I, I'm sure you're a fan. Amazing, yes. I mean, it's, it's, it's absolutely incredible, game. isn't it? That every scene is memorable. Yes. It's hard to explain, isn't it? And it's also, what's amazing, What uh, I think that, generally speaking, you know, two, 2D point-and-click adventures did amazingly was this, their ability to imply a much wider world. I mean, you, you went to the island in, in Fate of Atlantis and it's just, it's just a scrolling image, right? And, and you just feel that it's like this part of the huge world and then you go to excavation in the Arctic and it's just two screens and you think it's like this huge place that you keep on exploring. And I think it comes down to writing a lot. Yeah. Uh, and narrative design and how you space things out and, and how you you have people who can write well enough to, to help, you know, your mind conjure the, all the details that are missing. Incredible. I mean, I, this is a great, I'm really enjoying this chat. I'm, I'm assuming, <laughs> Constantine, I'm assuming you, you like games where you can actually make your own cities or you might not like. So SimCity, Theme Park, uh, Roller Coaster yeah. Tycoon, where you have the power <laughs> The Sims, is that your kind of, or, or is that not really your kind of thing? I enjoy them. Uh, sometimes I find them incredibly irritating. <laughs> for, for some, I mean, especially, okay, with SimCity, I used to love it as a kid. Yeah. But then, you know, I mean, during my, say, academic years, uh, at some point I found out that people were using SimCity as a um, professional training tool for, for young planners, and I found that completely outrageously criminal is stupid if not <laughs> downright evil i mean it's it was amazing it's like no 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 no. this is a game this is a toy actually not even a game it's don't use it like that do not do not try to use those you know horrendous simplifications that are fun when it comes to a game to, to explain society this, this i find incredibly irritating but i mean i am impressed i mean i do enjoy playing city skylines a bit I, yes, I love yes. playing Frostpunk. I mean, I, 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 I find those ideas where you actually try to apply sort of common urban planning sense to some sort of extreme situation way more interesting when it comes to a game. I mean, I, I do enjoy plots. The lack yeah. of plot is like, yeah. But no, I mean, I've played quite a lot of... Uh, I'm trying to think. I mean, yeah, City Skylines a lot. The Sims is not as much in the past few years. Theme parks, the theme parks, I mean, those, the, the other managerial planning games that do not have anything directly to do with cities, I, I find more enjoyable. I mean, I, oh, okay. I, I cannot, I don't get to fixate on what's wrong and just enjoy the thing. Yeah. Which is, yeah. yeah. Um, just leading on to your book, and I, I, these <laughs> might be in your book, they might not, but have you got any titles or games that you actually think, maybe your top three, that actually have got the best design cities or or landscapes, uh, best layouts, in your personal opinion? Well, I'd say that, I mean, if we, if we say for wider worlds, and, and it's definitely yeah. not in the book, I would say that Breath of the Wild is simply oh, perfect. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, as an open world, it's, I don't know, it's completely amazing. It's, I don't think I've, I've played the large game in, in a decade. I mean, I haven't played any other large game in the past decade, with the exception of this one. 
and yeah. I was shocked to see that I've actually spent something above a hundred hours on it. <laughs> yes, which I know. Was, yeah, I mean, it's completely unexpected. But it, it was a very, very impressive game. But then, I mean, if, if we narrow it down to, to urban environments, I would say that, I mean, um, you know, the, the, the two towns from The Witcher 3 are amazing, especially Novigrad, which was the, the one most people tend to know. It's a brilliantly play, created place. And you can see the, you know, the, the thought and the processes that have gone into it. I mean, you can see that despite, you know, the little flaws here and there, which are completely unavoidable. You cannot make a perfect city, but yeah. things feel real, feel, things feel grounded, and you feel the difference. I mean, every city in games says, you know, they have the rich and the poor, but there's, I can't remember of another fantasy city where the, the, the distinction between the urban poor and the truly destitute, like rural poor, is so obvious. I mean, yeah, you, which is exactly as it were during the Middle Ages. I mean, yeah, you could be poor in the city. It was not very good, but I mean, you were so privileged when compared to to the rural poor. So this distinction is was very, very interesting. And then I would say, I don't know if it's the best city ever, but it's it's, it's one I really love. I mean, the New, the New Orleans from, from uh, the first the Gabriel Knight game. Yes, yeah. It's it's an amazing place. I mean, yeah, obviously it borrows like 90% from reality or like the tourist take on reality, but it's yeah, it's it's a fantastic highly evocative place. So let, let's say those three. Yeah, good. Good. Um I I don't know if you got any of you on Max Payne. I always quite like that yeah, new as well. I, I like I actually loved the first Max Payne game. Yeah. Didn't get around to playing. I think there was just the one sequel, right? I think there's, there's, there's three. I think there's, three? there's a third one. It's not quite as well known. Yeah, by I think Rockstar Games made the third one, but the first two were made yeah. by Remedy. Yeah, but I mean the, the first one I absolutely adored. It's, it's great, isn't it? Um, yeah. Let's let's talk about your book. If, if people watch this on YouTube, they can see it here. It's absolutely incredible, and I really appreciate you sending it to me. Virtual Cities. No um, as as we spoke kind of off air earlier, it's it's a it's a meaty book. It's chunky. <laughs> it's very big and. I think you said was it was 46 cities are covered. Is that 45 right? 45 cities with 46 maps. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, what inspired you to... Do you want to explain the book a little bit to our listeners? What inspired sure. you? How did you think that this would... Well, I, I think it's a great thing, but it's quite original. You know, how did it come about? <laughs> so, well, the, the idea started off as a discussion between me and the, the artist. who she, She's a, like an ancient friend, and we've always been looking out for stuff we could do together, like something to collaborate on. And, you know, this was like this very, very vague idea that, yeah, maybe we could do an atlas or some sort of catalog of cities from, you know, probably games or something like that. And we're just, you know, very, very slowly discussing that and just, you know, sort of uh, trying to see where it could lead to. And then at some point I was approached by Unbound who were, interested in having a book about cities and games. And so, I mean, I had this concept already sort of brewing in my mind and we decided to, you know, give it a, a shot, see how it works out. And we did a few, you know, test chapters and stuff. And we were pretty happy with how things went. And Unbound was happy with how things went. And then they, because I mean, they always function with uh, this uh, crowdfunding platform of theirs. So it, it did brilliantly in crowdfunding, and yeah, this is how the book happened. Now, as to what the book is all about, it's well, it's it's an atlas that tries to recreate the feeling of the you know those old um, wanderer atlases of the nineteenth century, where you sort of get descriptions of those far off amazing places, but they're never they're never complete, they're never um, you know absolutely perfect and scientific. But they're mostly impressionistic, if you want. And yeah. this is this is the, the writing style, because, I mean, every city is presented from an in-world point of view, where you get someone's perspective on what description of the city in, in, in an attempt to be as thorough as possible. But obviously, a single person cannot be, like, com complete, completely thorough. And so this is, like, we have this descriptive in-world part where the city is reimagined in a completely sensible world. So, I mean, if there are things missing, if, if there's like, um, 
if the city's only a few backgrounds and you know a hundred words, we I get to actually recreate it into something more cohesive, more more complete. And then Maria gets to illustrate this in in ink. And then we get to work together and also with uh, Vivi, my wife, to you know come up with with a map that would also feel correct inside the city's uh, world. And, oh yeah, and then quite importantly for many, it's like and every chapter. So you have like the maps, you have the the illustrations, and you have the the main text. And there's also like this extra text, which is the I call it the designer's insights, which is a more technical piece of text, like in not in character, which sort of tells you what the city did well, what it did, like um, how it innovated, what it attempted to uh, to create in a new way and show off in a new way. And so something that's more for the designers and level designers and world builders. I, I love it. I mean, I have to, I've got my hand <laughs> up. When I was looking through the cities, I went straight to the games I love the most. And Makes sense. Again, it, yeah, I, I didn't start from the beginning to the end. I flicked through it and I, I purposely went to the ones. And what I like about it is you've got some cities that I think everyone that's listening will have some idea about. We're talking about, you know, Silent Hill. Uh, mm. Obviously, um, we've got uh, Resident Evil as well, I believe, there. But what I like, like I said earlier, you've got Monkey Island 2, which, which yeah. I adore, would tick. <laughs> And Lizard Breath, I almost, I couldn't believe it. It came from the <laughs> desert we mentioned earlier. I, I just thought, you know, it's a relatively obscure game that yep. people like, the people do like it, but it's not quite as well known as, you, what, I, what I like the most is you've done some really well, re, well known cities that I think a lot of people, yeah, but also those kind of more obscure ones that, yep. you know, real, you know, which is, how did you choose these cities? What made you select these games? Did you have like yeah. a, a big list or? No, it was, it was more of an idea like, okay, there are definitely the cities, I, I really enjoyed and, and I've enjoyed like, you know, for the past 30 or so, 40, how many, many years. And then there are like um, the, the really major representative cities that uh, pe people, you know, really think about when they think of uh, citizen gaming. And then I try to be as representative of, you know, most gaming genres and most eras and most platforms. And so, I mean, you definitely had to have something by Nintendo. You definitely had to have something that, you know, defined the PlayStation era and something that defined the, the Spectrum or the, um, you know, the Amiga. So it's sort of, you try to, to balance that and also make certain you have like genres like racing, for example, yeah, because yeah, yeah, yeah. It is a, it's, it's a very urban genre. I mean, it usually takes place in cities. But the city only acts as a background or at best as something that provides you with an initial, um, you know, track design. Yeah. So I, I, I try to sort of include everything in as representative a way as possible. So that's, I'll, yeah, that, that's how it went. Yeah, sure. I love the artwork, and um, who, who who was in charge of the artwork? Can you can I ask? Um, yeah, it's, it's Maria Kalikaiki. She's she's like the, the friend we're discussing the book with. She did all yeah. the illustrations. I think there must be like I have I had at some point I had this huge Excel with you know the how things are progressing. It must have been like 130 or so sketches and, and drawings. Oh. And then the maps they were at the. I, I did most of the concepts for, I mean, I did all the concepts for the map, like what, what we have to have in there. And then either Maria or, or Vivi, they, I mean, if you see there are like some more painterly maps, those yes. are by Maria. Yeah. And there are some more like engineering maps that like, they were made on GIS software. So <laughs> those oh, were yeah, yeah. by Vivi, so they're like, but it's, uh, yeah, it, it, Maria did the, the vast majority of the visuals of the book. It's beautiful, and um, I have to ask, <laughs> some, some some games in this obviously have maps anyway. You can click on the map view, mm -hmm, you have a map mm -hmm. in the corner. Whereas some games, for example, like Monkey Island, well, I did have a map, truthfully, but the actual wood tick map. How did you go about designing the map? Do you just kind of envision your, where the buildings were? And just yeah, that's been quite difficult. You sort of you sort of fill in the the blanks. It's right. I mean, if if you if you replay the games and looking out for all the possible hints, there will be hints in, in the game or in, in reviews of how the people that created that envisioned it initially. Yeah. And this helps guide you. And then, I mean, you just look at, at what they can say, good, is, is this enough for a city? No, because I mean, no one has place to live here. 
there's no presidential space. So let's let's move it on the shore and just you know sort of explain how this would look in 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 real life. So this is exactly what we did. So we sort of expanded Woodtick to to flesh it out and make it a complete like settlement. And, and similarly with uh, Half-Life 2 City 17, which is essentially like a long corridor with five landmarks. But then you, if you imagine it completely, it, it's like this vast modernist city, which now has an alien thing in its heart. Amazing. Um, I like how as well, you've got your three kind of areas. You've got uh, mm. fantasy cities, familiar and future. I think that's a very clever way of sort of breaking up <laughs> the book. <laughs> Um, that really took me a lot of time to, to decide. I mean, it, it's, it? it happened. Yeah, because I mean, I, I said, like, does it have to be like fantasy and science fiction and, and then contemporary or historical? It's a, I mean, you have this alliteration of F, you have like familiar fantasy and futurist, and it sort of just solves itself very, very neatly. Um, I like, like you said earlier, City 17. I love Half Life 2, and mm -hmm. I, I, I love reading your design comments. And actually, to be fair, you're not always 100% it's the best map ever. You, you can be critical, and I appreciate that. Yeah, um, and I, yeah, and it's really interesting hearing from like a professional's point of view, because I'm like, <laughs> what's wrong with... Oh, you know, it's you know, got a few little issues here or there. But I think it's, I think it's a really well-made book. You can tell... Yeah, you can honestly tell there's been a, a love and care into this. You haven't, you know, just chucked yeah, a couple of pictures in. You've taken you a lot of time on this. It was um, horribly exhausting. <laughs> horribly, horribly <laughs> so. <laughs> How long did it take to write and put together? Could I, I ask? Have you got was, it? Yeah, roughly speaking, it was like a year initial in, of initial stuff, and yeah. like not very hardcore work. Just like say 20, 30 hours per week on the book, and then at some point you have like the second year, which is. Oh, it must have been like, I don't know, 70, 80 hours per week on the book plus extra work and it was like completely and I, I was rushing to finish everything before before uh, my daughter was born because I knew I wouldn't have the time afterwards yeah. and it was completely exhausting and then we had to, you know, all the editing passes and the fixes and, you know, the re small rewrites here and there. But I mean, it was like in proper work, I would say it's like three full years on my part and at least a year full full year on on maria's part and yeah. half a year on on vivi's part so it's, it's like and that's uh, huge yeah. commitment yeah it was a lot it, it's the only reason why i'm not i don't know whether i would ever do a volume two it's like that you're trying yeah. to think that like can we do that again it is it even like possible on the exhaustion level <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Let's see. Yeah, I don't know. Do you have a particular favorite city that you researched or you really mm. got your teeth into that you thought, well, this is actually, you know, when you started to write about it, you got the most enjoyment out of? I would say probably, I'm thinking, um, you know, on Orlando, because I had tried to play Dark Souls yeah. several times because you know, everyone keeps telling you what a brilliantly wonderful game it was. And I mean, I could see that it was a very, very good game and everything. I was just absolutely certain that this is not the game that I can play and it's not for me. So you you sort of have to, to, to put the hours in and, and like endure and make it all the way to the bloody city. And that's when you realize that this is, this is a true masterpiece of, of, you know, right, like spatial yeah. storytelling and, and the way it, it explains it's, it's setting and it's the way it half explains its setting and, and like world to you is completely amazing. So this is something that I didn't expect to be as deep as it was. Uh, to be honest, I was thinking of, you know, this will be a good looking action game with a, you know, grim, dark thing going on. And it was like so much more. Oh, so th good. this was like the greatest surprise. Everything else I had sort of more or less, you know, yeah. I was familiar with. Brilliant. Was uh, there any games where you thought, I'm going to put this in, I, I've a brilliant idea, but actually you didn't like it for some reason, you didn't feel the... Th you mentioned Moonstone earlier, I don't want to put it in the spot, but I don't think Moonstone's <laughs> in there, for example. Was, no. it, um, what, was there any games you thought, ah, I, I really want to put it in, but just didn't quite make the cut for some reason? Well, several. <laughs> I mean, yeah, admittedly, there, there, are, there are many. I mean, I, I, would have, I would have liked to probably include the Britain from Ultima, Yes. Or you know the um, the Arcanum city, 
And they're, they're, I mean, I, I sort of the, the gothic game said amazing urban settings. I actually have this. Wait, let, let me open up this uh, Excel of cities oh, that never made it. Oh wow, excellent! I mean, they, they're actually the cities that made it and the cities that didn't make it. So the things that were cut was like okay, the city of glass from Mirror's Edge, Neo Kobe City from Snatcher, the Jetset Radio Town. And then we have, you know, wonderful places from, from the Gateway text adventure, like text this by legend, the uh, Superhero League of Hoboken, the New Jersey area, Baldur's Gate, you know. The, oh, yeah. And, and then there are also, I mean, we when we were, we had finished writing the book when Disco Elysium came out, and Disco Elysium would have absolutely completely made it, made it there. And then at some point, I think I will have to to force myself to replay The Last of Us, which I don't quite really enjoy very much. But who knows? Sure. I mean, it might be good. And then, yeah, you know, things like Captive, There's the second Captive, which, which had this huge procedural... And I think it also came out on the CD32. Mm. I think, I'm not certain. I had seen it only on a CDPC, but mm, good hit. Oh. Do you did you play all these games again? Did you almost force yourself to play every one again, or did yep. you watch YouTube videos, or what was that no, about? I, I sort of, you know, I, I did try in some cases to to use the YouTube videos, which they're good for giving you an overall, um, you know, like idea. But it's sometimes you want to look at specific things and you cannot. Oh, yeah. So yeah. I mean the. It's just, I mean, I never finished The Witcher 3. I just, you know, made it to Novigrad and then watched everything. I didn't finish Dark Souls. I just made it there and, you know, really explored there. But, I mean, I, I've i made this this mental promise to, at some point, return to those places and, you know, finish playing the games. Because they were very, very good, actually. Yeah, yeah. I, I should start finishing games again. Yeah. I, I don't know <laughs> I how. But... That's the problem, yeah. If you've got a bright, <laughs> if you're writing a book, you haven't... You got to say, well, I've seen the town now. I can't. I need to move yeah. on to another game. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, look, where can where can people buy the book? Is it is it? I know it's hard hardback, obviously, but is there an ebook available? Where's the best place uh, for? Yeah, yeah. I, I'll just I mean, look at it. First of all, I mean the the like the hardback, the the proper physical book can be bought like on on most places online. You know, from from Amazon to Bookshop.org to the Book Depository, all those places. And there are, there are. Uh, I think Unbound still has the um, the ebook version, which should be available in uh, you know Mobi, EPUB, and PDF. Yep. And I think it's also available like for, for Kindle on Amazon. And oh, good stuff. Yeah, I think I think it's it's available like as an ebook in most properly popular formats. I don't think it it suits it very well. I mean, as an ebook. Probably wouldn't. Ah, that's a lovely cat. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I got my cat in the background. Sorry. Yeah, it's a cat, so by definition, it's lovely. But it's okay. <laughs> what a joke. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I think it, it's it's way better in physical form. It's, yeah. It looks much I, better printed. I haven't seen the PDF version, and it was very nice of you to send it to me because obviously we do get the odd book come through now and then. Talk and it's like it's usually. <laughs> In PDF format, but you wouldn't get the feel. I don't think yeah. you get the feel, feel, feel of it if it wasn't like proper yeah. in your hands. I, I, I tend to agree, but and I, I usually, I mean, the only thing I read in, in in digital form is are things that are like you know cheap action novels, like pulp stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I wouldn't like have like I, I sort of imagine it as a reference, sort of like Atlas, weird imaginary places book thing. So that that sort of had to be physical. Um, I, you know, I I really do recommend it. I, I do mean that. <laughs> Thanks I'm, so much. I, was, I, I wasn't sure what to expect. I put my hands up uh, <laughs> because it's not a book I would because I I do have a lot of video game books, but I, I, this is quite an unusual concept. It's not focused on characters or a no. company per se. It's it's, un, it's very original, and I was like, I'm not sure it's going to be my thing, but I I was I, I actually really really enjoy re, re, flicking through, it. and I think the artwork is stunning I'm as well. Really so. glad to hear that. I, I, I honestly mean it. Um, I've got a bit of an interesting question, and obviously you've got to think carefully about this because you, you obviously want to survive. If you could enter one of these cities in your book and like live there for a week, let's say, uh, uh, where would you most like to visit? And I, I assume we wouldn't go down to Silent Hill, for example. No, no, no. We would definitely avoid Silent Hill and, you know, like 
Yanmar and all those. Well, if I were dead, Rubakava would be nice. Yeah. But I'd rather like give it some time. I I think you know like Woodtick Woodtick would be lovely. Oh, I mean, you you've got the sea, you you've got like the 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 non-threatening pirates. You've got you know excellent drinks that made served by monkeys who also play the piano. Yeah, uh, it's you have the I think gazpacho soups, which are being served yeah. there. You have yeah, nice hotels. Yeah, you have, you have everything, everything, and nothing that's particularly life-threatening or dystopic or about to to devour you and, and consume you in some nasty way. So I think probably probably would take. Mm. And well, I, I'd probably join you because I'm a huge Monkey Island fan. So <laughs> yes, it's, I I think that Monkey Island Two is is probably the best game of all time. I think it's. Mm. I mean, I, I'm I, there are lots of games I completely adore, but I mean every time someone asks me or we discuss the best games ever monkey island 2 is bound to be referenced and mentioned yeah, so i yeah. think this is my favorite of, of all time probably yeah it's probably it's my favorite monkey island game i would say i love it, it it's, 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 yeah. it's brilliant um the first one's amazing uh the other it, it, the other ones are good but the one and two were the true. pinnacle i think i think that the others but they sort they're too different they're fantastic games especially the third one it's a very very good game but i I mean, it's not something I, I like yearn to, to return to. It's like, good, I played it, fun, that's it. That, that, that's it. Yeah. For me. I don't like, whereas the Monkey Islands, the, the, the two original ones, I tend to revisit them semi-regularly. Yeah. Yeah, good stuff. And, well, while we're on that, because I know we, we're both huge LucasArts fans, what, why do you think uh, how, they're so iconic? Their games, Day of the Tentacle, you know, Sam and Max, you know, Fate of Atlantis, The Dig. Why do you, mm. why do you think they were just so good at creating the uh, such good worlds? I think, I mean, first of all, they, they had like excellent storytellers. They they and they were storytellers who knew how to pace those things and build them around puzzles and plots that put you at the center of things. Yeah. That, that's one thing. And then I think they really understood th their medium. They knew that some things would work way better in this in this format. And for example, they tended to be more humorous than, I mean, even the dig had its funny, weird moments. Yeah, yeah so dark humor. Yeah. It's it sort of the 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 verbs that you were given to play with and the interactions you sort of uh, made happen they were cohesive with the overall atmosphere of things you were not like in this super grim dark place where you got to combine a banana with a monkey to you know do something they they knew their medium and they also created those intricate worlds that felt you know very very palpable because you could look at things you could click on all sorts of little details and see what happens yeah without the the fear and anxiety that you're going to do something wrong as as would happen in a sierra game for example and then you would die. yes 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 so you were sort of relaxed enough yeah to give it a go and just and i mean if you remember we we really didn't have walkthroughs or access to to no. hints back in the day. I mean, you just hope that your major gaming mag would publish a hint that would help you at some point. Exactly. So, I mean, you really, you really interacted and got to know those games like deep down. And yeah. And I, th I think they, they just, they had excellent artists. I mean, Mark Ferrari was amazing and Steve Purcell was amazing. And they still are excellent artists who really understand what they're doing. And you had like great writers, people who were, I mean, people who were working for this huge corporation, but for some completely odd reason were given the the freedom to just do the things they believed would work. So they used their resources to do pretty amazing stuff without the need to to impress, you know, middle management by selling billions. Yeah. Yeah, think, well said. It, yeah, yeah, it was a very unique position to be in. And I think... This is something that I can imagine the people at Nintendo are enjoying. Because I, I remember Miyamoto at some point saying that I'm not staying for my salary at Nintendo, but I'm staying for the money they give me to pour in a game. It's like this sense of creative freedom plus the resources to achieve what it is you want to. Well, if you have, if you have talented people, then you probably get to do amazing stuff. Yeah. 
I think you, I think that's well said. Constantine, thank you. Um, you hinted that there might be a sequel to Virtual Cities, but yeah. what projects can you can you reveal any other projects you, you're working on? You're thinking about? Is there any games you're working on? Is it all, yeah. all very all hush hush at the moment? I'm trying. Well, hold on a second. Now, right now, <laughs> I am finishing up work on a pen and paper RPG, and we are right. actually yes, we are we are. I think it's going to be very, very innovative. It's from a small studio, but they've already earned quite a few accolades and some awards, and they've done some some amazing little games. And we want to create uh, an almost procedural way of creating cities on the fly for for games. So this this was very interesting so far, and this is something we are wrapping up right now. And there was I actually created a city for a pretty large company and now I'll, i will be returning it to it in january i think just to flesh out certain but i don't think i can say much more about that lake is coming out by game use in, in a few in a few months i think in a, in a month or so it's, it's really around the corner and there's a chapter in the forthcoming book by chris bateman it's called uh, ah, come on narrative uh, narrative something Oh, why, why am I not remembering? It's called Game Writing, and oh. it's uh, it's edited by Chris Bateman, and it's uh, about narrative skills for video games, and this is like a thing. And then, uh, what else am I working on? I'm, I'm working on a small city concept generator on my own, and probably a friend will join in to, to do a thing. And, you know, still writing for, for Wireframe magazine, the, you know, the, the city graph volume on... Yeah. Oh, on nice. you know civil design what else what else yeah we're still teaching level design and stuff at uh sa athens you know to to animation and art and game design students what else am i doing trying to do a bit of academic stuff on on games yeah like there, there's some there are always you know talks and papers and conferences which are i mean they're not work they you know, don't get paid for that but they're like things i feel one has to to try and do so i mean things things are they're, they're constantly busy and also yeah, today yeah. i i painted my my daughter's room because we had like this broken pipe in the bathroom which created the whole, which sort of fucked up a wall and i had to you know you know sort of half tear it down and then plaster the thing and then paint it and today i almost finished it which is a huge triumph oh well done <laughs> yeah thank you yeah <laughs> so yeah it's been a bit hectic those past few years i mean i'm really looking forward to i don't know relaxed laid-back 50s yeah this is <laughs> this is this is my my huge goal good on you. And you can then you can go back and complete those games you started <laughs> no ago. yeah that i would be very 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 happy to do that i mean that and at some point we were discussing with a with a friend who's like he's uh I mean, he, he's uh, mostly a programmer and game designer, and he he works on on games. But we were thinking about you know making this very historical um, city building game at some point on you know Mayas and stuff, which would be very interesting and come with very unique mechanics. But it's right now another side project is something I couldn't really support. At all. Fair enough. Um, I've got another question for you about games and a design and uh, is there any game that you maybe liked you like the characters of the story but you you found the city design very poor or you felt they got a few things wrong and actually let the game down for you personally is there any examples of games you, you thought you could you wish you could be involved in just fixing a little bit i i you know something i would say i mean i don't know whether i would be able to to make anything better obviously because i mean it, it was way back but i think that at least the original takes of cities in world of warcraft were decidedly yes. underwhelming i mean right. you were expecting this huge place where you know kings and empires and mages and wonderful people all frequent and everything happened. you just go there and it's like 10 huts and a wall and that's it i mean stormwind was incredibly disappointing mm. and that's one and then you know i tend i tend to to sort of forget the things that really disappoint me, you know, try to, to focus more on the stuff I like. So I can't come up with, I mean, with something that I stuck with despite its uh, 
poor urban setting. I, I don't think so. I can come up with something else right now. I mean, I, I can say bad things about SimCity all day, but yeah, that's a <laughs> completely different thing. Fair enough. Um, obviously, you're you got a PhD, um, and you got into the video game industry quite interestingly and quite you know uniquely. True. What, do you have any advice to anyone that wants to get in the video game industry, but maybe has a qualification that doesn't quite match up? You know, it, it obviously, is, what, what would you say to people that are thinking, "Oh, I've kind of gone down the ro- wrong route, route here"? Would you still yeah. say go for it? I mean, without wanting to destroy anyone's lives or, or you know, just create the sense of stupid optimism, I, I do have the sense that the games industry has grown enough to support or even demand all sorts of different um, specializations, let's say. So I, I do I do distinctly remember seeing this advertisement that was like just a, a some sort of article, it was by CD Projekt Red, and they were asking for a hydraulics engineer to help them with Night City and the oh. design of its um, sewage systems and piping and everything. And I, I remember as a student, like actually hating those, those like, subject you know the whole piping and hydraulics engineering and everything it was like incredibly dull and at some point seeing that oh look this this is actually being applied to games nowadays yeah. we've come to this level of detail where even such a specific generally speaking one of the dullest parts of engineering would be to design you know a drainage system for heaven's yeah, sake. yeah yeah it's incredibly boring and yet you can see that this is something people might need and sometimes you see that people from different disciplines come in and bring completely new fresh views so i i think it's it's very plausible it's very plausible and it can be done and if if people are in, willing to put in the the stupid work hours <laughs> demanded to, to yeah. especially in the beginning to sort of not make a name of yourself but you know somehow earn some money while doing things it's it's definitely worth pursuing i would say and it would be good both for for them and for for gaming as a as a whole yeah bring in some real niche specialities yes, i like I that mean, why yeah. not yeah i've got a couple of twitter questions for you a couple of people who respond <laughs> on twitter um uh, this one's from, I think, Grief Burrito. He asks, I'd love to know if he had the choice to blend the tone and environment of, from two game worlds, mm. what would they be? So you could combine almost two worlds together. Mm. No, that, that, that's an interesting one. I would say, it is, isn't it? you know something, it, it would be fun to have this open world that came from the desert. So you could have something like, you know, like a, the, the Skyrim technology supporting the wider area of cinema wears B movie thing and have lizard's breath, you know, yeah. fleshed out with everything and visit the minds. That that would be interesting. That's something I would enjoy you yeah. know exploring. Or what else? What else? Or you know, maybe that would also be interesting, you know, apply this um the the, the way dishonored um approaches space in this in, in that it essentially curates urban space and just shows you the important bits yeah. instead of you know presenting you with a more or less in some points just needless needless uh, open world so you could have like something like Dishonored's uh, approach you know used in something like um, I don't know let's say you know Central the Third if we, if we are sticking in the book and, uh, and see how yeah, yeah. Out. like if you if you would have the chance to have less space to explore, but this space would be populated with more interesting stuff, that that might be something worth seeing, experiencing, playing. Sure, why not? That's good, good answers. Yeah, yeah no, I, I like that. Um, we've got one here from, is it Tom, I think, from at Power Drift Pod, and he says, give, give him my thanks for a great book and also his great encouragement during the very early days as a reader of the Dreamcast Junkyard. Does that oh, make yeah. sense? I <laughs> yeah, didn't quite that understand makes... that. But... Yeah, yeah. Tom Tom is one of the first people I, I, I met and, and liked, you know, with, via social media and, and blogging back in 2005 or six or seven, something like that. Lovely, lovely guy. 
and she also convinced me to buy a Dreamcast, which I still have. And yeah, <laughs> it was a lovely <laughs> console. It was already retro by then, but still loved it. And yeah, he hope hope he's doing wonderfully. I mean, we do very very rarely get a chance to you know say hi and stuff. We sort of do different stuff, but it's yeah, fantastic guy. So <laughs> thanks for that. And he's got a podcast, just a fully committed to you know power, um, rally games. I think how unbelievable. That's 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 fantastic. I, yeah, I think I enjoy. I used to enjoy both rally and rally games at some point. And then at some point I drifted away from all sorts of sports. I don't know why. That's what right, right. happened. Well, um, look, check it out. No, yeah, th thank you, uh, Constantine. It's really, really, really enjoyable chat. I've generally enjoyed it. C keep us up to date with any future <laughs> projects or or games and so forth. Um, Seriously, thank you. thank you. Got one final question before Absolutely. I say goodbye. But it's, it's been really enjoyable. Um, if you could share a few drinks with any video game character, who would you choose mm -hmm. and why? I, I ask it to everyone. You can change your answer. I know you did a similar <laughs> question in your text uh, interview a while back, but you can choose someone else if you want. <sighs> Let me see now. Doesn't have to be from the book or anything, right? No, so no we... it doesn't have to be from the book. And what do I like? I mean, gaming doesn't have too many likable characters. I mean, or like not. Maybe Commander Shepard is is interesting enough. And good. I mean, in my mind, it's it's a she, so she would have like a lot of things to tell you about stuff. Yeah. And Dallas, yeah, probably her, but she's not like she's not fun, is she? She's not like that. <laughs> so, yeah, she... Oh come on. <laughs> hmm. Someone from Yakuza, perhaps. Yeah, sure. Oh, wow. Now that That's would be answer. interesting. Yes, yes. I would love to to visit Camrocho with like the like big hairy strong guy next to me, just keeping things safe. <laughs> that would be yeah, that I would love to have a the drink there with someone. You know, from a good, nice mafia family. Yeah, sure. Why not? Good. That yeah, good answer. Uh, I would say this um, is this answer for today, at least. <laughs> well, thank you again. Seriously, really thank you. Appreciate thank your you, time today. Really great chat and really good luck with the book. You know, we'll put a link in the show notes. <laughs> to where um, and you're on Twitter, aren't you? So, what's your yes. um, what's your uh, Twitter handle? Top of your it's, head. Uh, it's at Gnomeslayer. Gnomeslayer. G N O S E M A L M E S Lair. Yeah, that's it. And people can chat you there or they, yeah, they yeah, can sure. find links on your book there, can't you, and stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Look, really enjoyed today and uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Adrian. That was absolutely lovely.